a lot of legislation coming through and a lot of push towards the science of reading across kind of the country. But what I'm noticing is that sometimes all of this legislation, what it's doing is instead of providing clarity, it's actually providing some more difficulty for teachers because they're being given these textbooks that are so stuffed full of so much stuff that they can't possibly teach it all. And so it's like, well, what do I do? What do I leave in? What do I take out? I used to think that a really good textbook would be a lifesaver for a new teacher. But now I kind of think that if you're a new teacher, it's going to be difficult to wade through, honestly, a lot of the nonsense in order to figure out what is actually good about the text. Over this summer, I have been working on this research project with um, a couple of gentlemen that I know. And what we've been doing is we have been looking at four different core curriculums. We've been looking at CKLA, Benchmark, HMH, and Open Court. And what we've done is we've literally read through the lessons, looked at what the teachers are doing, and tried to just determine what is it that these textbooks are doing. And the more I've read these textbooks, the more I've realized that oh my gosh, they are stuffed full of so much stuff that a teacher can't possibly get through it in a day. So tonight, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about how we can improve comprehension. And I know I've talked a lot about a basil already, but I want to talk about how we can improve comprehension no matter what text we are teaching and talk about what we can do if we have to use a basil in the process. Can you let me know in the comments if you happen to have to use a core curriculum, and if you do, can you tell me which core curriculum your district has chosen in the group chat? I hear CKLA, CKLA. Ooh, Savas, my view, that's one I haven't looked at. 2025, my perspectives paired with foundations. And I don't know about y'all, but I live in Gloucester or yeah, I live in Gloucester, Virginia. And every district in Virginia had to choose a core curriculum, a super old treasures benchmark advanced. All right. So it sounds like a lot of you do have to, oh, some of these are actually ones I haven't heard of. New house. Is that Tracy Whedon? All right, so if you do have to use a basil, you know that it is kind of stuffed full of a lot of stuff. So let's talk today kind of about how we can weed through some of it. Feel free to ask me a question whenever in the chat. I have the chat up over on um, my other screen, so I should be able to see it. We really have two main objectives that I want to go through tonight. I want us to talk about six ways that we can improve comprehension no matter um, the textbook we have. It says with any basal series, but I mean whatever text we have. And then the second part of this, I want us to talk about, um, in the second part of this, I want us to talk about some things that we can ask of the text that we are being asked to use in order to help ourselves make sense of it. So I wanted to start by saying this, teacher knowledge is truly the one thing that they can never take from you. And what I mean by that is this, legislation can change. Your administrator can change. They can change whatever they want, legislation, textbooks, administrators. But if you have the knowledge about how kids learn to read, that is the one thing that truly can never be taken away from you. And that's where I like to think that I come in and people like me come in because we help to disseminate the knowledge that we didn't always learn in school. If you were anything like me, I did not learn any of this stuff when I was in college. I wanna talk about why reading comprehension is so difficult. Nancy Hennessy, if any of you have read The Reading Comprehension Blueprint, it's a beautiful book. It's, it's kind of dense, but it's very well written and it's just fantastic. And she tells us this, the ultimate goal of reading is comprehension. It's not phonemic awareness. It's not can you answer two multiple choice questions. It's not how fast you read. The ultimate goal of reading is comprehension. Um, for our readers to reconstruct the mental world of the writer. And because we are skilled readers, this usually feels pretty effortless for us, right? 
And comprehension kind of flows naturally as we read along. When I'm reading a David Baldacci book, I'm not sitting there thinking about whether or not I'm understanding what I'm reading. I'm just reading it. But Nancy tells us that this sense of ease is really misleading because it kind of belies the complexity of what we actually have to do as we read. There are so many different cognitive and linguistic things that are coming into play when we're reading. And it's difficult to pinpoint one aspect of comprehension. So if I have a child who is struggling to read in first grade, I can look at them and I can say, okay, well, you know, CVC, you know, Digraph, you don't know blends, magic, ER controlled. And I can kind of fix that, right? But fixing comprehension just isn't that easy because you don't know where the comprehension is falling apart. And because comprehension depends on what text you're reading. Every text you are reading, your comprehension is going to vary on it because you have different amounts of vocabulary and background knowledge. Comprehension is tricky because comprehension is slippery and it changes with the books that we are reading. There has been a big debate recently about this idea of should we focus on strategies or should we focus on teaching content for comprehension. Has have any of you heard of this? Let me know in the comments. Have you heard of like this content versus strategy focus kind of battle going on? All right, I haven't gotten any comments on it, so I'm going to go ahead and assume no. Oh. <laughs> so basically, this is what oh Oh, somebody's writing something on me. Okay, yes, you've heard of the um the the battle. Sorry, I think not being able to stream this to Facebook really got me messed up a little bit, y'all. Got me threw me off my guard. What this sort of aspect of the reading wars is saying is this. There's one camp that says we should be teaching strategies to our students, that it is teaching strategies that is going to help them comprehend text better, comprehend text better. Things like teaching the main idea, teaching summarizing, teaching context clues. That's really um, embodied in this book, Strategies That Work. It is a very skill focused where I choose a skill of the week and then I'm going to choose text that for um, that week that are going to help support that main idea or visualizing or whatever I'm trying to teach that week. I choose the skill, then I choose text. Whereas a content focused instruction is starting with the text. It's saying I'm going to choose a bunch of text around a single topic and then I am going to um, decide which strategies my children need in order to successfully understand that text. I think it's important to note that we're not saying stop teaching a strategy to children. What we are saying is that the strategies are not the end goal. Comprehension is the end goal. And there is some research to support some strategy instruction, but there's just nothing out there that supports strategy instruction in the way that it's been taught for a long time. There's really nothing that says this week we're going to teach main idea and you have to remember it forever. Next week we're going to teach uh, context clues and you have to remember it up forever. That's just not how the strategy instruction needs to look. And I also think we've been misled about what the actual strategies are. I'm gonna show you the eight strategies that actually, I don't know how to delete this. Somebody had drawn on it. We're just gonna have this blue, this blue line, I guess, on here. Cause I don't know where it came from or how to remove it. So yeah, we're just gonna, we're just gonna hide live edits. Yep. Yeah, y'all, I don't know where that came from. It's just going to be there. So it might surprise you when you see that these are the strategies that are supported by research. It's not really what I had had in mind. Um, definitely things like summarizing. But look, you've got graphic organizers are a strategy supported by research. Learning story structure, cooperative learning. These are the strategies that we have that are supported by research and not necessarily this lockstep kind of strategy instruction that we find over on the left here. So now let's talk about the six tips to improve comprehension with any text. Tip one and two are going to be very similar, um, but I think that there's an important distinction. The first tip that I wanna give you to help improve comprehension instruction is to use thematic text sets. 
Instead of choosing a strategy and then choosing books that would support that strategy, let's start with a topic or a theme. Because what you are then able to do is you are able to help build knowledge around a topic and children are able to understand more text and they're able to understand deeper if we are able to give them the opportunity to live with a topic for a while. So you can use nonfiction. Last year as a reading specialist, what I did, I had access to the lesson plans in my school and I would look at my science teacher's lesson plans and I would see what she was teaching coming up and I would figure out how I could um, how I could support her. So if she was teaching uh, planets, I might do a space unit. Or if she was teaching electricity, I might do an energy unit, something like that. So using thematic text sets like science and social studies text. So for social studies, you could do something like the American Revolution, or you could do westward expansion. For fiction, you want to choose text sets that are built around the theme. So you could choose books that are built around a theme like honesty or friendship or perseverance. You want to have a bunch of books that deal with the same issue because then children get to see the different faces of it. Children get to see how honesty works with this character and then begin to recognize it with this character over here. If you do a unit on um, the solar system, maybe you start with just basic planets, but then before you know it, you're showing them pictures of the James Webb telescope. I am going to stop sharing my screen for just a second to see if that blue line will go away because it's gonna drive me crazy. Okay, I think it went away. And we're back. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how you can build some text sets around the topic. This example would be good for like first or second grade. And it's just around the topic of plants. You would start with something super simple. This is a passage from ReadWorks. And if you use ReadWorks, let me know in the chat because I'm obsessed with ReadWorks. And I really hope I get to introduce ReadWorks to somebody today. ReadWorks is one of the very few things out there that's actually still truly free and nobody wants anything from you. If you do not have an account, I want you to get an account two nights from ReadWorks. You can find a variety of texts fiction and nonfiction on so many different topics. And it is a teacher's treasure trove of, for finding text. So like I said, you might start with something simple, like what do plants need, where you can talk about the different, um, they need water, they need light, they need soil. Yay, I found someone who hasn't met ReadWorks yet. You will not regret it, Allison. Definitely sign up for ReadWorks. Starting with something simple, but then you can build from it. Maybe you start by talking about just basic plants, but then you can dig into different kinds of plants, like how are sunflowers different from cactuses? How do um, sequoia trees differ from cactuses? And you're going to notice that this is super basic. This is not this very deep dive yet. We, in the beginning, are giving them something simpler so that we can then build into deeper things. Because once we give them an understanding of plants and the different kinds of plants, think of all the different places that you can go with it. Then you can start talking about plants in the ocean. You can start talking about carnivorous plants like pitcher plants and Venus flytraps. You can have them look into their own plants. You can talk about agriculture. You can read fiction books about it. But think about how much shared language is going to come in across those texts. And the more children see vocabulary words and the more we talk about it, the easier it's going to be for them to understand these concepts. So sticking with a theme or a topic for several weeks, if you can, is such a powerful move. And it's one that I had wish I had started sooner because when I began doing it in my intervention groups, it was the first time in the entire time that I was an interventionist that I really saw movement in upper grades. It is much more difficult to intervene in the upper grades and taking this approach was the first time that I really saw the needle move for these kids. The second tip goes with the first tip. So the first tip I told you, I want you to start building some thematic text sets. The second tip is to then actively build background knowledge. I was listening to this podcast. I think it was Amplify Science of Reading podcast and Sharon Vaughn was on it. And she said this, she said with enough background knowledge, comprehension comes free. I'm going to repeat that. With enough background knowledge, comprehension comes free. 
because we know that once decoding is out of the way, it is how much relevant background knowledge and vocabulary a child has about a topic that is going to determine how well they understand it. We simply cannot overestimate the importance of background knowledge. There is a really famous study out there called the baseball study that basically split kids into four groups, high achieving, high reading, high reading achievement, high baseball knowledge, high reading achievement, low baseball knowledge. Then the other group was low reading achievement, low baseball knowledge, low reading achievement, high baseball knowledge. And you know what they found out? They found out that the kiddos who were poor readers could compensate just as well as the higher readers if they had the background knowledge about the topic, which, whoa. So maybe we've been looking at this differently for a while now. Maybe it isn't so much this strategy instruction, but it's helping kids to understand about the world because the more you understand about the world, the easier it is to understand text, the easier it is to understand anything. A perfect example is when I'm watching football with my husband. He can understand the individual plays. He knows what they're doing. All I know is that they're trying to run the ball back and forth and they're going to make like seven points if they get it down the side. Our background knowledge about the topic of football is wildly different. Just like our background knowledge that our children bring to a text is wildly different. So if we can take a moment or a few moments to help actively build background knowledge, then we are giving our kiddos the opportunity to level the playing field. I'm gonna give you several ways that you can build background knowledge. I'm not saying that you need to use all of these. Please don't try to use all of these with one topic, but I want you, when you're done with me tonight, I want you to think about one of these ways that you can use to actively build background knowledge. So let's talk about it. The first thing is by using videos. I love using videos to build background knowledge. We are not taking the cheap way out when we use videos for our kids. When a child is reading, what they're trying to do is they're trying to recreate this mental model that the author has written, right? We want our kiddos to be able to have in their head an image of what the, the author is writing about. But some of our kids, their experiences are so limited that they can't think about understanding the rest of the text because they've gotten stuck on what a Venus flytrap is. Some of our kiddos simply cannot make that mental model if we don't give them a little extra help. And showing a video is a perfect way to do that. For each of these things that I'm showing you right here, I'm showing you how I would build background knowledge on the topic of plants. I just chose a random topic. The example I have here is... So cool. What this person did is they planted something and then they did a time lapse video for over a thousand days. Think about how much more engaged children would be if they got to watch a time lapse of a pepper plant growing over three years. Is that three years? For about three years, as opposed to just showing them this. That's a big difference. That is a way that you can help them to get that mental picture of what the author is talking about before you even put the text in front of them. I do have a couple of guidelines I like to keep in mind with videos. Try to keep them under five minutes. Always watch the video before you play them to kids. I know I know time's short sometimes. Play that video beforehand. And I like to keep the um and I like to keep the uh closed captions on because I figure why not give them another opportunity to read, right? Videos are a powerful way to help build background knowledge. The next way is with photographs or illustrations. For a plant, it's easy. You can just show them an illustration of all the different plant parts. Maybe you find pictures of the different plants and you ask them which ones they have around there. I know here in Gloucester, we are like, we used to be the largest daffodil exporters in the world or something like that. So I'm pretty sure my kiddos have background knowledge about daffodils. We have a literal daffodil festival, but they're going to look at some of these other ones and have no idea what they are. It just goes back to having varying degrees of background knowledge. This is a really simple example for plants. But another example could be if you were doing something like the I Survived book for the children's blizzard. I don't know if any of you have read that one. That one's a pretty good one. 
if I wanted to show photographs or illustrations to help build background knowledge for this realistic fiction book, sorry, historical fiction book, what I could do is get maybe photographs or illustrations of what schools looked like then, because they're probably thinking a school is like what they go to now, not realizing that back then a school was going to be a one room schoolhouse where all of you were in the same class. You could show the clothing that they wore at that time, what houses looked like, because the story of the children's blizzard kind of hits a little bit different when you think about the world, what the world actually was like when it took place. You're always just thinking, how can I help to create this mental model? How can I help to give my kiddos an edge with background knowledge to make accessing the text easier? We have gotten away from using maps and globes. This is my third tip for building background knowledge. I remember when I first started teaching, I felt like we all had those little pull down maps and globes, you know, on our, um, on our walls. And then they all just kind of started disappearing. And there are so many things that we can do with maps and globes. If you're teaching some historical thing or something that is set in a specific place, that's a very obvious place where you can use maps and globes. When I was creating this presentation, I really wanted to get a seed packet, but they are out of season now because on the back of seed packets, what do they normally have with maps? Y'all know? On the back of seed packets, they typically have maps that have when you should plant. It would be really cool to show kiddos, okay, well, why do you think that you can plant some plants in May or June, but these plants you would have to wait until later in the year. And you can talk about how these ones are closer to the Arctic, so it's colder, that kind of a thing. And then the last tip for building background knowledge is bringing in physical artifacts. A physical artifact is just something that your kiddos can hold on to so that they just have a better understanding of what you're talking about. For plants, an easy one would be seeds. Let them all plant seeds. But let's think about some other um, things that we could bring. Say I'm learning about space. Maybe we bring in a model of the solar system. Maybe we bring in astronaut food, that freeze-dried stuff. Maybe we bring in replicas of moon rocks. There are so many different things that you can bring in to have the kiddos touch and feel and have a better understanding of what's going on. If you're still here, can you just drop in the chat, which one of these do you think you might use? I feel very weird because I don't have my Facebook up with this like I had wanted to. So which one have you or will you try to use? Videos, photographs, illustrations, maps and globes. Don't use them all at the same time. It'll take your whole thing. Yes, these are great. And I, wa I wanted to show you all that video, but I don't know how copyright works <laughs> with this. Good. Did it today with pictures of skunks. That's awesome. So it sounds like a lot of you are already doing this. And I want you to think if you have to use a basil, are there ways that you can still incorporate this into the stories that they are giving to you? And we're going to talk more about it. Oh, someone said they've done a couple of crafts. Kids love crafts. Now, have you ever heard of Wonderopolis? This is just a little bit of an aside, but Wonderopolis is a really, really cool website. It has a question every day and it um, it has a question every day. And then with it, it has like an article and a video or some images. And if you are trying to teach about planets or the American Revolution, they have a search bar and you can see what they have. And it's, it's just a really cool website that I don't hear very many people talking about. So take a look at Wonderopolis the next time you're planning out your kind of your background knowledge um, that you want to do and see if there's anything on there for the topic that you are looking at. Someone asked if I could share the website. Absolutely. You know, I'm going to go ahead and pull it up now. So you can see Wonderopolis. So I was teaching in a district that was using, I want to say it was HMH. And HMH has this unit that's all about art. And so I was showing them 
what is your definition of art? Because it played in directly with this fourth grade unit in HMH. But I want to see what the I want to see what the topic is today. Have you ever tasted an Arab taco? How are currency exchange rates? What is a zebra giraffe? Somebody in the comments, tell me what you're teaching in science right now. And what I'll do is I will search it real quick. It's just wonderopolis.com.org. And if you hear yelling in the background, it's my cat. Not yelling. He's just moving around. Natural resources. Let's look. So what is a, oh gosh, how do you say that? But, butte? <laughs> what is biomimicry? How great is the Great Barrier Reef? Someone else said farm animals. Let's, I'm going to just look up one more. And farm animals. It's just a really cool website that people don't talk about very much. Do animals protect other animals? Do animals use GPS? Can animals get sunburn? It's a really cool way to have kiddos just to start thinking about the world and continuing to wonder. When I was teaching fourth grade, my at my, the very beginning when I started teaching fourth grade, we would do this every day. And the kids got so used to just like thinking about the world and wondering about everything that they came across. And it was really cool. All right. So that was my second tip. Oh, gosh, I'm going to run out of time. The next tip I want to give you is to start at the sentence and paragraph level. We oftentimes think of comprehension in the global sense meaning we give them a passage, we ask them to comprehend without thinking about the fact that comprehension can really start to break down at any point. It can break down, honestly, at the word level, but especially at the sentence in the paragraph level. I am going to show you a quote from Kate DiCamillo's Because of Winn-Dixie. It says, she liked to plant things. She had a talent for it. She could stick a tire in the ground and grow a car. Tell me, how could comprehension fall apart here? How could comprehension fall apart? What might be tricky for our kids? The pronouns. Oh, yeah. Who's even she? Because a lot of times the pronouns will, um, a lot of times, the pronouns will be referring to something a long time from like several lines ago. Also this, this idiom of she could stick a tire in the ground and grow a car. You know, you and I both know these kids are going to take that literally. They don't understand idioms right away. It just, hey, kids are so literal. Yes. No, she couldn't literally stick a tire in the ground and grow a car. It meant, actually, I don't even know what they meant from it. Maybe she was good at automatic, automat automotive stuff. This is talking about Opal's mom, by the way. I wanted to show this to you just because this is three sentences that are very simple, but could cause a problem for kiddos. And when we start to have one little crack in comprehension and then another little crack in comprehension, it just keeps building and building until the whole thing falls apart. This could be an example where you would be like, all right, she's not actually going to stick a tire on the ground and grow a car. What could this actually mean? Thinking about sentences and paragraphs that are going to cause problems for our children is a really smart move before you read any text. This is something else from ReadWorks. As I'm reading it to you, I want you to think, where could comprehension fall apart? What does the author assume kids can do? I meant to look up how to pronounce this plant's name, so we're just going for it. The unusual rafflesia does not have an important part that most plants have, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll causes the green color in plants and is needed for the important process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a process by which plants transform sunlight into energy for the plants to use. Some scientists argue that rafflesia isn't even a plant because, since it has no chlorophyll, it can't photosynthesize. Because rafflesia cannot get nutrients from photosynthesis, it relies on a vine called tetrastigma. Lafflesia grows as thread-like strands of tissue that are connected to this vine. Lafflesia then takes nutrients and water from the vine. Tell me in the comments, what is hard about this passage? And this is fourth grade. The vocabulary is wild in this. Lots of big words. But then also you have to have an understanding about 
what makes a plant and what plants need in order to understand why this is an issue. If you don't have a true understanding of photosynthesis, then you don't get you don't really get why they're arguing about whether or not it's a plant. This would be very difficult for children who have limited background knowledge about plants. But what if you had taken the time before this and read text that went through photosynthesis? What if you had built text sets where a lot of this stuff had already been talked about? If you had already talked about chlorophyll, if you had already talked about photosynthesis, then all of a sudden this is much easier to access because you don't have to think about what the argument even already is because you already have it in your head. Oh, well, if they don't do photosynthesis, is that even a plant? The amount of background knowledge you bring to this is going to determine how well you understand this. My fourth tip is to teach text structures. <laughs> this is one of those examples where I really didn't do it when I was in the classroom. I, I didn't understand why they were important. I might pull out a Venn diagram every once in a while because I knew graphic organizers were helpful, but I didn't know why. But I get it now. I have been talking so much about background knowledge and how the amount of background knowledge you bring to a text determines how well you're going to understand a text. What you need to think about with text structure though is that text structure actually is a kind of background knowledge. If you come into a text knowing that this is a sequence text or that this is a compare and contrast text, if you come into it knowing what kind of text it is, it's going to be, you are going to be able to understand that text easier because you are going to be able to anticipate certain, certain things. You know that in a narrative, you are going to have a problem that is going to come to some kind of a resolution. You know that in problem solution, you are going to have one or more problems that are going to need one or more solutions or resolutions. So teaching children the text structures gives them a leg up. We have different graphic organizers that we can use. It doesn't matter what graphic organizer you use. I would say just make sure whatever you are using, you stay consistent with it in your school. I think about how powerful it would be if children starting in kindergarten had seen the exact same graphic organizer for each of the different text structures from day one in kindergarten. Think how differently they would approach a text if every time they had seen a text like this, they had seen one of these graphic organizers. You would just have to pull out a graphic organizer for them to automatically know, oh, this is what I'm looking for in this text. Text structure helps us to have that background knowledge about how text work. I've been talking about text structures and I didn't even tell you what they are. There are two kinds of text structures. We have narrative text structures and expository. We tend to think of fiction versus nonfiction, but it gets a little bit hairy because then when you have things like biography, well, they're technically nonfiction, but they're also a narrative. And they also include things like dialogue. And we don't really know what George Washington said to Martha on the eve of Christmas 1782, right? Like we don't actually know that. Um, but so if we think of it more of narrative, because even fiction and nonfiction narrative, the structure works the same. And then expository. Expository is going to give you information about something. We have descriptive, which are like those DK books that kids love, like when they go and get a cat book out of the library and it just tells you all kinds of facts about cats. Sequence is a step-by-step -step something like how to make a PB&J. Problem and solution is when you have a problem or multiple problems that have to have solutions or resolutions. Comparing and contrasting is when you have two things and you are looking at how they are similar and how they are different. And then cause and effect is because this thing happened, this thing happened. I hope, I know that this, this tip was very short, but I could keep talking about it for a long time because it, it is so important to help kids understand how different kinds of texts work. You don't even have to teach them the content of the text if they just, well, you like, you don't have to teach it as much if they know how the text itself actually works. Here are some signal words that you might see in a in um, these different texts. 
The only issue I have with teaching these, and I'm not saying that they're bad, but one of the issues is that they can be misleading. Um, someone asked if I have, yes, if I have a list of the graphic organizers, I'll put a link, I'll put a link towards it. I do have a, um, the graphic organizers. The issue with these signal words is that a signal word can really be in any of them. Just because it says because doesn't mean it's going to be a cause and effect text. So that's where it gets a little bit hairy. While these can be helpful, we don't want to over rely on signal words. And these are my tips for teaching text structures. I want you to introduce one at a time. So don't try to do all of them and like do a sort of them on the first day. Try using paragraphs instead of entire text to start. You could even ask ChatGPT, please give me a descriptive paragraph about plants. And they do a beautiful job. I've actually had ChatGPT write me text structure paragraphs and they did a great job. I want you to model how you would fill out that graphic organizer. Um, sometimes we think that like, oh, well, the kids need to be able to do it themselves. Yes, but show them, take them through it maybe even more than once or twice, take them through that graphic organizer. And my last tip for teaching text structures is I want you to tell the students the text type and give them the organizer. Don't make them guess at whether it's descriptive or problem solution, because we want them to start understanding how texts work and eventually generate what kind of text it is. But for now, let's give them the text type, give them the graphic organizer to help them start to see those patterns. All right, my fifth tip is to teach pronoun reference. Earlier, someone had said, oh, well, that, that sentence is problematic because it has so many pronouns. Yes, this is what we typically think about when we see people teaching pronouns. You would have a worksheet where it's like, Mark went to the store to get groceries, blank, forgot the milk, and you'd have to fill in the blank. But that's not how this really helps us with our reading. I'm going to read this passage to you from Alice in Wonderland. And this passage has it five times. And I want you to think about what each of the it's are. There were doors all around the hall, but they were all locked. And when Alice had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door, she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. Suddenly, she came upon a little three-legged table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on it except a tiny golden key. So what's the first it? The first it is the table. And Alice's first thought was that it might belong to one of the doors of the hall. What's the it here? The key. But alas, either, oh, sorry. Yeah, but alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small, but at any rate, it would not open any of them. That it is going to be the key. However, on the second time round, she came upon a low curtain she had not noticed before, and behind it, this one is the curtain, <laughs> was a little door about 15 inches high. She tried the little golden key in the lock and to her great delight, it, last it is, it fits. The last it is the key. All right, I want to show you what I actually do with my kids and I've never used this annotate tool on here. When I have a text and I have an it, what I have them do is I have them highlight the pronoun. And then what I have them do then what I have them do is I have them draw a line from the pronoun to the noun that it is standing in for. So this one is the tiny gold key. So we would circle it and then tiny gold key. This one, I would circle it and then drag it to the three-legged table. And I just have them do it with a highlighter. This it is the key. This it and you will be surprised how quickly kids pick up on this. I didn't realize my kiddos couldn't often identify who or what was being talked about once they had an it. It especially gets tricky when you have multiple subjects like you see here. All right, let's see if that goes away on my next slide. Okay, we're going to trash it. Clear all my drawings. Yay, look at that, I did it, okay. All right, someone said using a graph, oh, it's David, hey, David. Using a graphic organizer while 
reading the text together was a game changer for me. When I started teaching, I was given ten. Oh, David, that's so smart. Yes, do it while you're reading. David, I used to give it to him after it too. You're so smart. All right. What does it refer to is a very common question too. Absolutely, it's a very common test question. And they, if we give them the practice of searching back in the text to try to figure out what the pronoun is representing, it, it makes a big difference. The last tip before we get into questions to think about with basils, and I know I said we'd be done at 8.15, but we're going to be done around 8.30. And if you're like, girl, you're talking too long, I will, this is recorded. It's going to be on YouTube tomorrow or the next day. So feel free to go to sleep if you got to. The last tip is going to be, yes, someone asked if graphic organizers were okay for first grade. Absolutely. You just might have to do it together or maybe blow it up and do it like that. You can use these tips with any text, it just depends on how much the, the kids are able to do. Like the age depends on how much they're able to do, whether or not they are reading the text and they are doing these things on the text as opposed to y'all reading the text together and then providing some answers to you orally. Writing about reading is important because when we write things, it helps to make the knowledge sticky. How many times have we said, oh, I gotta write myself down a note or I'm gonna forget about it? literally every day, all day of my life. When we write about what we are reading, it helps us to remember it more. And writing in whole, as a whole, has been just abysmal um, in this country, in the United States. I'm going to share with you, I'm going to skip that because of time. I'm going to share with you one strategy. This comes from the Writing Revolution by Hockman and Wexler. And it's called Because, But, So. And what you do with this strategy is this. You have a sentence kernel, and then the children have to create three sentences using the conjunctions because, but, and so. Because what this does is you get three complex sentences. The first sentence using because gives you a reason why something is true. The second sentence using but gives you a change in direction. And then so gives us a result. You simply cannot answer questions like these or is finish a sentence like this without having knowledge of the topic. You're going to notice that the, this one is a very general, doesn't have anything to do with the text. You can start this strategy orally and just start by having them do one of them. I love summer. I love summer because I get more time with my daughter. And then you model that for them and have them provide their own and they can do this orally. I love summer because, and they have to give you reasons. And then I love summer, but I do not like the heat of the summer. So for each of these sentences, you can model it for them before you ask them to do it on their own. And you can do it about a topic that they don't have to have a large amount of background knowledge for. But look at how this could look for a topic like science. And think about how you literally cannot answer these or finish these sentences without knowing a lot about Pluto and the planets. So Pluto is no longer a planet because it doesn't clear its orbit. Pluto is no longer a planet, but many people still fondly remember it as one, like this elder millennial. And Pluto is no longer a planet, so it is now classified as a dwarf planet. This is some very sophisticated thinking, but your kids can do it with enough modeling and don't try to do all of it at once. I made that huge mistake with my kids. Start with because, then add in the other ones. Another example, adaptations help animals survive because of what? But what? What did the so? Oh, so gives you a result. So adaptations help animals survive so that they may live long, healthy lives. I don't know. I didn't really think that one through. Um, if I had time, I would have had a better response for it. But like Plato is no longer a planet. Okay, so what's happening because of that? So it is now classified as a dwarf planet. And if you look up because but so strategy, you'll find a lot of a lot of things with it. Now, this last thing that I want to talk to you about is four questions to ask yourself if you have to use a basil. I know that a lot of us simply do not have a choice. You are being forced to use a basil. You are being told that you must use this basil with fidelity in order to achieve the results that you want. Kind of upsets me a little bit, though, because I can tell you right now, 
that probably nobody in the history of ever has been able to adhere to complete fidelity with these basils. There is simply too much in them. One of them, for example, HMH, the least amount of time they recommend for the ELA block, the least is 130 minutes. They recommend 130 minutes to 205 minutes for the English language arts block. Who has that? Nobody. Nobody has that much time. So from the get-go, certain programs, it becomes impossible for you to implement because you don't even have the time that they say it's going to take. I want you to also keep in mind that it is people writing these curriculums. And it is not just one person writing it from start to finish. There are teams of people writing these this curriculum and people are follow fallible. When we are forced to use a basal, all right, hold on. Let me um, let me read this question and then I'm going to respond to it. So when we're forced to use a bagel, basal, how can we argue that our building background knowledge, vocabulary and strategy isn't giving our class an unfair advantage over another class? I guess my response would be good. <laughs> I want my kids to have an advantage. I want all kids to have that advantage. I want us to be able to use the knowledge that we have to do the very best job we can for the kids in front of us every single day. And I think we need to move away from teaching with fidelity to teaching faithfully to like what it's asking of you. We don't need teachers to read every single word verbatim because the people writing this, I can tell you right now, they never sat there and did this lesson themselves to see whether or not it worked with kids. Let's go ahead and get into some of these questions, okay? Um, because even if you are expected to use a basil with fidelity, you can still ask some questions and maybe do some small tweaks to refine the lesson. The first question I want you to ask of your basil is this. Are the vocabulary words that they want me to teach, tier two words? Becca McEwen, bringing words to life, they talked about three tiers of vocabulary. Tier one are those simple everyday words that we use in everyday language. We don't really need to teach those unless it's an English language learner because unless there's something going on cognitively, Everybody's going to learn those words. It's things like sing, want, the, is. Tier three words are those words that are specific to content. Things like photosynthesis. They are the words that, yes, are important to understand concepts. However, they aren't the words that we really need to teach explicitly and in depth when we're doing reading. Tier two words, those are the words that we want to teach with a good deal of explicit instruction and practice. A tier two word is a word that's not just going to show up in a science textbook. It's a word that's going to show up time and time again across a variety of contexts. All I want you to ask when you are looking at these words, if you're like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, tier one, tier two, tier three, ask yourself this, is this a word that is going to help my child in the long run be a better reader because it's gonna show up enough times. Is this word going to show up enough times that it warrants me to give them explicit instruction? This is an actual list of vocabulary words from a third grade unit. And I'm looking at this list and it's not a bad list, but do you see any words on here that might not be worth you teaching to great depth. I see larvae and molt. Yes, I agree. I feel like those two words are very much tier three words. A larvae, we can just say it's like a baby bug, right? The very beginning of the bug. I don't I don't see that being a word my child my children have to know again and again. So maybe when we're teaching the vocabulary this week, we pay more attention to those words that we know are going to show up again and again and again. And we can kind of just gloss over the words. Larvae, that's just a little baby insect. Kind of just gloss. Um, and then I think I think the rest of them patch. 
Patch is a good one because it's got multiple meanings. Like patch is a good one because you can have a patch of land, but you can patch things up. All right, my second question. This goes with what we have been doing this entire presentation. Does this textbook actively build background knowledge? Boiler alert, probably not. I've noticed, because I told you I've been reading from four core curriculums all summer. I have noticed that it almost feels like background knowledge is just a tiny box that curriculum companies put at the top of a lesson just so they can say, look, 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 we have background knowledge. Because the background knowledge that they are asking is just kind of weird. There's one company that in fourth grade, they're going to be learning about space. And <laughs> When they have the kids with the teacher activate background knowledge, what they have this the teacher ask these nine year olds, these fourth graders is, what do you know about the space race? They were nine. They know nothing about John F. Kennedy and the space race like they know nothing. But that was it. That was the only background knowledge that was even talked about. That is not enough. Look at this. This one is a third grade from a basil. And at first, the first thing it had them do was have the teacher read the title aloud to students and have the students talk about it. And then have students suggest examples of inventors and inventions that have changed the world or made everyday life easier or more fun. Come on. That is such a difficult one for kids. I don't know if you put me on the spot if I could tell you that. And the only reason I can right now is because I've been thinking about it. So instead of doing verbatim, this kind of non-specific, vague, activating background knowledge, let's try to actively build background knowledge and engage our kids in the process while we're doing it. I was thinking about what I would do for this. I think I would talk to them about Plato because Plato originally was invented as um, a substance that you would put uh, on your wall to get rid of uh, like the smoke and stuff from fireplaces. And then once people started having electricity, they didn't really need it. And this guy's sister was in a daycare and she let the kids play with it. And that's how Plato came about. Now that is a lot more interesting. That is a lot more valuable than just having kids suggest examples of inventors and inventions. It, it's a small shift that's gonna have a bigger impact for our kiddos. The third question I want you to ask is how much is this textbook having you talking? And how much work is it having the kids do? I've never met a textbook that I actually didn't expect teachers to over talk. If you are currently teaching from a basil, you know it is like page after page after page of teachers talking before you even get to the text. Um, I really just wanted us to think, are there places that we could back off of the teacher talk? For some reason, some a, a good example of this is that some of these basils really like to give you a lot of background information about the authors before you read the book to kids. And I don't know about you, but I don't go and look up Emily Henry's autobiography before I read a book. Like that's not necessary to move my kids forward. Is it interesting? Sure. But when I only have a certain amount of time to teach my kids reading, I'm not going to waste it on things that aren't gonna move them further. Background knowledge about the author isn't exactly the kind of knowledge I need to understand a text, unless it's like a memoir. All right, and then the last question I want you to think about when you are having the last question I want you to think about when you are looking at your basil is this. How much text are the students exposed to in a week? How many books are we reading? I am shocked that so many textbooks only have kids read one text a week. We need to really think about the volume of text that we are giving to our students. Just think of it like this. If we read one text per week in a 36-week school year, that's 36 texts. If we only bumped it up to two, that would be 72. But if our kids read three texts per week, 
That's over a hundred different texts that they have read. I'm not saying that there is some magic number of texts that our children need to read. What I am saying is that volume matters. And if your textbook is not giving children the volume of text that they need, and if you are stuck with having to teach those lessons, this is how you can get more texts in. Start teaching texts in your small group that relate to the text in your whole group. Those thematic texts sets that I was talking about building, you can build them in small group. You can still teach your whole group like your basil is telling you to do, and then continue to work in background knowledge and build background knowledge when you are in small group. Children simply cannot become proficient readers without enough reading, volume of reading to reach automaticity and to, to be able to know a whole bunch about the world. So these are the four things I really want you to think about when you're looking at your basil. None of this is life altering because it can't be. If you are forced to teach from a textbook with fidelity, there have to be small, subtle, meaningful shifts that we can make to make it easier for ourselves and more meaningful for our kiddos. Whether that is skipping a vocabulary word or two, adding in some things to actively build background knowledge, taking out some of the teacher talking or adding in another text to increase their volume. They are small things that you can do to have a big impact. Looking at this list, is there something that you could do to make some subtle shifts in your textbook series to make it more meaningful for your kiddos? All right, well, I'm going to move on. Hopefully something pops up in the chat here soon. Thinking about how we can continue to make these small shifts with our instruction. All right, everyone, we did it. We made it to the end. And I'm sorry that this wasn't streamed to Facebook like we had intended. Something has happened and I have to reconnect it. If you are not yet following me, you can find me at Campbell Creates Readers anywhere this is my email address. If I didn't get to your question in the chat, please feel free to email me. I'm here for you. I also have a website where I talk about a lot of these things. Oh, here we go. No, now we've got some questions. Woo. Okay. Yes, someone, I will share that graphic organizer info in just a moment, okay? Um, so I also just wanted to tell you too, because this is something brand new to me, I have released a podcast and it's called Creating Readers with Savannah Campbell. And the first two episodes are out. The next episode next week is actually going to be all about building background knowledge. So I hope that you will check it out. It's only on Apple, Apple Podcasts right now mainly because I'm the one who has to do everything. And so it takes a lot. So thank you so, so, so much for being here. I'm going to take a couple of minutes to look back on this chat. But if you need to stay or you need to go, feel free to. And I am so thankful for you for being here, even with the technology, technological snafu. So thank you so much, everyone. And I am going to stop recording. And then I will answer some of these questions.